five. Jeremy Hunt has got the bedside manner of a very competent doctor. It's all very calming. If you're being rude, you might say soporific. Four. He's delivered this steady as she goes budget. A lot of his own backbenchers will be saying, why aren't you taking more risks? Why did you raise corporation tax? Three. You couldn't help thinking that he was sort of busy treating a series of symptoms rather than the underlying pathology. Jeremy Hunt is now Jeremy from accounts rather than the cape crusading tax cutter which he wanted to be when he was campaigning to be Tory leader. One. We have lift off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast ordinarily with Alison Pearson and me, Liam Halligan. But today, dear listeners, co-pilot Pearson, she's away on a special mission. More on that later. And because Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has just delivered his spring budget, I'm delighted to welcome back aboard the Rocket of Right Thinking, the Telegraph's associate editor for business, the excellent Ben Wright. Ben, great to have you with us for this Planet Normal budget special. Great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Well, after the market turmoil that followed the Liz Trust quasi quateng mini budget in September, Jeremy Hunt's main aim was to deliver an unremarkable steady as she goes statement. And that's what he did in the House of Commons yesterday, brushing up his credentials not so much as the tax cutting radical he said he would be when he tried and failed to become Tory leader last year. Instead, he was Mr. Safe Pair of Hands, low impact Jeremy from accounts. <laughs> it was a political canny statement, in my view, Ben, upping childcare provision and freezing the household energy price cap designed to appeal to hardworking households, especially young families struggling in this ongoing cost of living crisis. On the other hand, going ahead with that increase in corporation tax, a massive rise from 19 to 25 percent, the first increase in this profits tax since the early 70s, that will rile many Tory backbenchers, as well as hitting countless small and medium-sized firms, as well as the corporate big boys. Jeremy Hunt claimed this was a budget for growth, Ben, for long-term sustainable growth. Is that how you viewed it? Not really, no. I mean, I think uh, unremarkable is a word you use there, and I think that's probably fair. Listening to it, it sort of struck me that Jeremy Hunt has got the, the sort of bedside manner of a very competent doctor. It's all very calming. But if you were being rude, you might say soporific. And you couldn't help thinking that he was sort of busy treating a series of symptoms rather than the underlying pathologies. And actually, Keir Starmer sort of extended the medical metaphor. He said the economy needs major surgery. And I think even those who don't want the Labour leader wielding the scalpel will probably agree with that. Hunt said that his priority in November was to deliver stability and now to deliver growth. But I think that with the fallout and the memories from Quasi Quata's disastrous mini-budget still fresh, it was probably the reality was he wanted to continue to deliver more stability, and that's kind of what we got. And it was interesting that he started out by comparing how things like yields on government debt, which effectively the barometer of the country's stability have improved since last year. Indeed, I know you want to get on to potential market fallout, not least because there seems to be a slow motion European banking crisis happening as we speak. Yeah. But I think it's worth saying at the outset, Ben, that where Jeremy Hunt said a budget for growth, an economy proving the doubt is wrong, the economy's proved the Office for Budget Responsibility wrong. It was only in November that OBR was saying that the UK would spend the whole of 2023 in recession. The Bank of England said the recession would go on even longer than that. Yet now we've got the OBR saying that while the economy will contract a little bit during 2023, there won't be two successive quarters of negative growth. There won't be a recession. And also inflation, currently still in double digits, of course, by the final quarter of this year will be down at 2.9%. All other things being equal, we're by no means out of the woods. Many people listening to Planet Normal will feel the cost of living crisis is ongoing. But in terms of the macroeconomic outlook, it's a lot better than many people thought it would be. Definitely a lot better. I mean, I think it's sort of a mixed picture. It's interesting, the OBR, as you say, it's definitely upgraded its forecasts. And it is also looking a lot more optimistic about what's going on in the economy than the Bank of England does now. Yeah, you're right. They're saying we're not going to fall into a technical recession this year. But we are contracting and the UK will be the worst performing economy in the OECD this year, according to the OBR. 
which side of zero we're skirting on and you know there won't be two consecutive quarters of contractions as we're not in a technical recession but equally growth in future years has been revised down so yes a little bit better but still quite heavy going i do want to get into the weeds of the budget statement i know like me you'll have listened to it very very closely and as you steer the telegraph's coverage in today's paper and into the coming days as well. But we do need to talk about Credit Suisse. It sounds inane to a lot of listeners. This is one of the biggest banks in Europe. It's a top 50 bank in the world. It's about roughly the same size as NatWest in terms of the size of its balance sheet. And its share price has fallen by about 30% at the time of recording. Yeah, It seems that there is ongoing reverberations, ongoing contagion, more medical analogy alert, <laughs> from the failure of that bank in California, the Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of uneasiness out there, definitely. And the fall of Silicon Valley Bank going bust has not calmed anybody's nerves. And in some ways, Silicon Valley Bank shouldn't have affected the wider system because it's obviously, it was a mid-sized bank. It was quite big, but it was mostly a retail and business bank. It wasn't what you would term systemically important, didn't have a lot of counterparty exposure to other banks. So the fact that it's gone bust shouldn't have had massive repercussions, but I think it's sort of raised concerns that in a environment where interest rates are rising, that often makes things go bang in the financial system. And it means that potentially there are other nasties lurking on the balance sheets of other banks around the world. And that's what people are worried about. And they've obviously focused in on Credit Suisse because it's quite a recent history of making big financial missteps. And on Tuesday, it announced that it found material weaknesses in its financial reporting for 2021 and 2022. The news on Wednesday was that its biggest shareholder won't increase its equity stake. I mean, it's saying it's not going to do that for technical reasons, but it means that one of its big backers is saying that it can't help out. And Credit Suisse, as you say, is a big bank. Mm. is systemically important. Mm. So if things get worse there, then that will have massive reverberations. We're very experienced financial journalists. Ben, The Telegraph is obviously an extremely respected news source. We need to be careful about talking ourselves into a panic here. I personally disagree with some of the commentators who have been talking about this as a layman moment, evoking the 2008 financial crisis, which saw, of course, the collapse of the mighty Lehman Brothers on Wall Street. I personally think, and I'd be interested in your take because this is really your area of specialization, Ben. I personally think the world's leading banks are now much, much tighter regulated than they were. Their reserves are in better shape. There's been a lot less on balance sheet risk taking than there was in the run up to 2008. Of course, there are holes in the regulatory safety net by definition, but At least here in the UK, we've seen a major bank take over the UK subsidiary of Silicon Valley Bank. And so we should escape the worst of the financial turmoil. Oh, yeah. I mean, I totally agree with that. In a way, you can't have a Lehman Brothers moment because of all of the new rules that were put in place after Lehman Brothers went bust. As you said, these banks are far more tightly regulated. They've got far more capital. So you're not going to have a repeat of what happened in 2008. But equally, no financial crisis is an exact replica of the crises that came before it. I mean, in some ways, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank showed the system working really, really well, right? It's gone bust. It's shareholders, the people who've lent it money are going to lose their money. But the depositors are are going to be made whole. Biden announced day before yesterday, I think, that all deposits are going to be guaranteed. And there's generally a limit on compensation when banks go bust in terms of deposits, right? But that limit has been waived in this instance. Yeah, the deposit insurance scheme. We have it here in the UK. It's £85,000 for retail deposits. In the US, I believe it's $250,000, so a little bit higher. But a lot of the companies that had deposits at Silicon Valley Bank were big, fast-growing tech firms, and they had a, a lot more money than that in there, which is partly why they were worried, partly why they were pulling it out, and partly why there was a bank run. But Biden said, no, they're all going to be made whole. The Republicans are kicking up a bit of a fuss about that, and they're claiming it's a bailout. 
but it isn't really. The bank is going to be allowed to go bust or bought for a peppercorn amount by another bank in the US if they can find a buyer for it. The depositors are being made whole, but it isn't really a bailout. And I don't think any taxpayer money is being used. So really, it's an example of the system working well. It is interesting, though, that a lot of people have noted that there was a slight rollback in financial regulations in the US in 2018 under Trump. He brought in an act that meant that some of the smaller and mid-sized banks wouldn't have to be subjected to the same sort of regulatory oversight as the very biggest banks. And the threshold was moved such that Silicon Valley Bank was no longer regulated quite so tightly. And had it been, it is possible that the regulator would have started raising red flags about the fact that it didn't have a risk officer for a year. It was investing a lot of its money. As I say, it was growing incredibly fast, getting a lot of deposits from these tech firms. And what banks usually do is they take the deposits and they turn them into loans. And those loans will earn the bank more in interest as interest rates go up. So that's how to stay healthy. The Silicon Valley Bank had taken so much in in deposits so quickly that it couldn't make the loans fast enough. So it had instead invested that money in debt. And as interest rates went up, the value of that debt fell and it found some of its investments underwater and it had to sell them at a loss in order to meet redemptions from the depositors. And that's basically what sparked the run. So there was a slight rolling back of the financial regulation in the US, and that may have caused some of the problems that they're now suffering, because there are other regional banks facing difficulties. It's interesting that relevant to the UK, because the UK government is also looking at possibly rolling back some financial reforms, trying to get the financial system helping boost growth. These are the reforms that have been labelled the Edinburgh reforms, some of them looking at what institutional investors are investing in. And you can imagine that Jeremy Hunt will come under some pressure to allay those. He mentioned them in the budget, actually. And yeah. He said he would be looking at them in the autumn. So that's possibly been kicked into the long grass for now. Beautifully explained, Ben, and I know that you and the Telegraph business team, Chris Williams, will be looking at this closely over the next few days in our business pages. But just as you alluded to there, this market turmoil may mean that an easing of bank regulations in the UK and US and elsewhere may not happen. I think the market turmoil is also politically important for the Chancellor, because he's delivered this steady as she goes budget, a lot of his own backbenchers, the real opposition he's facing at the moment, yeah. will be saying, why aren't you taking more risks? Why did you raise corporation tax for the first time in 50 years by six percentage points, a huge proportionate increase? And he will now be able to look those backbenchers in the eye and say, have you seen financial markets over the last 24 or 48 hours? A hundred percent. And I think it will give him political room for manoeuvre to say, I'm not taking risks, I'm the grown-up in the room, and it will also mean he can fend off more cynical observations that he's saving up his tax-cutting sweeties until next year, just before a general election. Yeah. Remember what happened when Kwasi Kwarteng did his mini-budget? and The big thing there was a big raft of unfunded tax cuts, and the markets took fright, and interest rates rose, yields rose, and that caused something to go pop, something to go bang in the pension industry. And I know you know this, but the slightly esoteric area of liability-driven investment. Don't get me started on LDI. Alison will never forgive me. Okay, well, we'll <laughs> get over it. But basically, it was an area of the pension industry that basically suffered its own version of a bank run, and they became forced sellers of the assets that they were holding. So what happened in reaction to Kwasi Kwarteng's budget has just happened in the U.S., before Hunt's budget. And absolutely, you know, he wants to be probably, I would have thought philosophically, he wants to be cutting taxes, but he doesn't have a huge amount of fiscal room for maneuver at the moment. And he doesn't have a complacent market. He has a, a febrile environment out there making it harder to make these kind of decisions. Where do you stand on the great corporation tax debate, Ben? I've been railing against this rise in corporation tax in my Telegraph columns. Other writers, Matthew Lynn, Roger Bootle, the likes of the National Institute, a very august economic think tank, have been saying that raising corporation tax will lead to less business investment, may even lead to less growth. Some people say corporation tax rises are a perfect example of the Laffer curve because you end up getting less tax overall 
because of the impact on growth. Do you accept that argument in principle? Yeah, I do. And I mean, the other element of it is the timing. Do you want to be raising corporation tax right at the very moment that you want businesses to be investing, taking people on, employing them, and pulling us out of an economic slump? Corporation tax rise is going from 19% to 25% in April. So next month. And it's just at the time that we want all businesses putting their shoulders to the wheel and helping pull us out of an economy. They're going to get hit by this. I mean, I don't know what the absolute rate is, but the very fact that you're raising taxes at this time is not great, I would say. And I mean, obviously, Hunt himself said he wanted to be the most pro-business, pro-enterprise tax regime anywhere. And it's sort of pretty hard to say that with a straight face when you're raising corporation tax. Now, he did, of course, announce full capital expensing which will be welcomed by big businesses. For three years rather than two, as we expected. Yeah, it is just three years. So there's a danger that could bring forward planned investment, not increase it. And, you know, some of these big projects take ages to get shovel ready, as they say. Sometimes you need three years just to get planning permission. (laughs) And the rest. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So he's sort of giving with one hand and taking with the other, but I think he's probably taking more than he's giving. When I look at this corporation tax rise and the reason I've been uncharacteristically outspoken about (laughs) it is because we've just spent tens of billions of pounds keeping companies alive. And if you take six percentage points off a company's margin, many of our companies with the highest levels of employment operate on thinner margins than that. So it strikes me as incongruous at a time, as you say, when we want to keep the economy moving We've dodged a bullet with this recession. Let's get clear of the relegation zone, if you like, and try and get back into the mid-table. And the other thing that strikes me, it's a point less frequently made, is that we're about to have a situation just after the Windsor framework, still a very fragile situation in terms of Northern Ireland's relationship with the rest of the UK and indeed with the Republic of Ireland, the rate of corporation tax in Northern Ireland is about to be double the rate of corporation tax in the Republic across the border. And it's very difficult when we're trying to attract investment into the UK in general, but particularly in Northern Ireland, an area full of talented people and entrepreneurial ability that has been economically disadvantaged for far too long. That is a very, very stark statistic, isn't it? Yeah. Literally half a mile down the road, the rate of corporation tax is half what it is in Northern Ireland. Yeah. And as you say, he mentioned the two great challenges that the British economy are facing. One is workforce participation. So he's announced a couple of things to get more people into the workforce, especially parents of of young kids, a a childcare package. And he's trying to induce people not to retire early because there's a lot of people in their 50s who appear to have retired early and have exited the workforce. And we could talk about what he's done for pensions there as well. But the second one was business investment. So if you're saying that that's one of your two big challenges facing the economy, it just seems incongruous that you would, at the same time as saying that, hike corporation tax. Now, obviously, he's got to bring in the money. But as you say, there's strong possibility because of the Laffer curve doing what the Laffer curve can do that he might not make a huge amount of money out of it. And actually, it's interesting. I saw a chart that the OBR has put out where it's looking at how much is going to be raised by the expensing of capital expenditure. And it actually falls. It falls over the long term. So he's given away this tax, £9 billion in pounds giveaway. And essentially, it just looks like that will boost profits in the short term. I worry about the exchange, if you like, of a higher headline rate of corporation tax for broader capital expensing. It's not, of course, higher capital expensing because we've got a super deduction in place, which is 130% offset. And we're now going back to 100% offset, albeit for three years, with the Chancellor saying in the speech he wants to try and extend that further and even make it permanent, I think was his phrase, non-committal, but certainly suggestive. It concerns me, Ben, that yes, we must always remind listeners there's a threshold for corporation tax. You pay if you clear 50 grand in profit and between 50 grand and 250,000 pounds, there's a taper in place. But you don't have to be a particularly big business in order to start paying corporation tax. Yeah. And I'm concerned that while the small and medium-sized enterprises, which I know you often champion in your writing, 
and broadcasting, as do I, the companies that employ over half our workforce and account for two thirds of growth in the UK, whereas they will be clobbered with the high headline rate of corporation tax, they can't avoid that. They won't have the deep pockets or the ability to raise finance in the current environment to make the investments to take advantage of the full expensing. So this is a trade off the exchange, as I say, of a higher headline rate on the one hand for broader capital expensing on the other. This is a trade off that will favour the big boys rather than the small and medium size enterprise strivers. Yeah, it was a very good point. And it also it links together with what's going on in the wider world and what's going on with Credit Suisse and banks, because this is going to result in banks pulling their horns in. Lending less. They're going to be lending less, right? Yeah. And they're going to have to be putting more money aside. And who does that hit? It disproportionately hits smaller and medium-sized enterprises. The big boys can go to the capital markets. That's right. The wholesale markets for money, if you like. Exactly. And they can raise debt and it will be more expensive for them because interest rates are going up, but they'll be able to do it. The smaller and medium-sized enterprises, as you say, they rely on bank loans. And if the banks are pulling their horns in, it's going to be harder for them to get that money. So just at the time that they find it harder to get financing, they're also going to be hit by higher tax. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, but my pals call me Chopper, and you can too. Just dropping into my second favourite podcast to tell you about another Telegraph show, mine. As a Telegraph's chief political correspondent, I spend my days holding politicians to account and asking them about the things that affect you. I speak to top politicians from across the political spectrum, commentators with their finger on the pulse, and of course, my talented colleagues at the Telegraph. So if that sounds like your cup of tea... Please search Chopper's Politics wherever you're listening to this. Cheerio! I wanted to mention and discuss with you, Ben, this pension allowance. I was broadcasting on GB News throughout the budget statement, and my GB News colleague, Gloria De Piero, who you know, former Labour MP, extremely canny political observer. Yeah. The moment that Hunt said that the annual tax-free limit on pension contributions was going to be raised from 40 to 60,000 pounds and then he followed that up with the only real rabbit in the hat yeah. saying that the lifetime allowance wouldn't be raised from just under 1.1 million pounds to 1.8 million as had been trailed in the papers but the lifetime allowance would be abolished altogether. Gloria literally jumped out of her skin and she said, tax cut for fat cat pensioners. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? She said, if I was advising Starmer, this we were off air, she won't mind me for saying it, because she, she said something similar on air. The moment she heard it, she said, that's what Labour should be going on. They should be going on the fact that the size of these pension contributions annually, 40, 60,000 pounds, to the vast majority of the population, this is completely otherworldly. Yeah. The idea that you'd have a pension pot above a million quid. Some Telegraph readers, Planet Normal listeners, will have worked very hard in their lifetimes. They will have trained themselves and they will be in that fortunate position of relative comfort. But people suffering badly in the cost of living crisis, they're just about managing classes, folk often living in the red wall where the election is going to be won and lost, this will seem like a tax cut for fat cat pensioners, won't it? Yeah, well, I mean, Gloria is exactly right. I mean, Starmer didn't need the advice, though. He did latch onto it immediately. He said the only permanent tax cut in this budget is for uber-wealthy pensioners. And yeah, I mean, it's a lot of money. I mean, the way that Hunt framed it was with around the crisis in the NHS, because there are a lot of doctors who claim that they have sort of being forced to retire early because they're hitting the lifetime allowance and it doesn't make any sense for them to work. So he was sort of framing it as a way of trying to address the crisis in the NHS. But the fact of the matter is, yeah, it's right. It's we're going from just over a million quid to one point. It was, we thought it was going to be 1.8. It was going to be capped at that. And now it's not going to be capped at all. So it's the people who are going to benefit from the difference between what we expected to happen and what actually happened are those who have accumulated over £1.8 billion in their pension pot. That's not very many people. (laughs) That's a very low single-digit percentage of even the population above 50, right, let alone the whole population. Yeah. I mean, crikey, 
What's Generation Z going to think about this? What are the millennials going to think about this? What are people who are in their 30s and 40s still struggling to get on the housing ladder going to think about this? This struck me as similar to when Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng said, you know what we're going to do now we're in power? We're going to cut the additional rate, the top, top rate of income tax from 45p to 40. Yes, you can argue it was at that rate throughout the vast majority of the Blair Brown years. But the timing seemed politically tin eared. And I think the timing of this, again, I'm not I don't want to penalize at all hardworking people who've done well in life, maybe built a business and sold it or worked at a very high level in an organization throughout their successful careers. I don't want to diss them, but it doesn't strike me that they are the people that need the Tories help and the exchequer's help at this point. I think you're right. One of the big issues that this country faces is generational inequality. And this can only exacerbate that. And it will smack of the Tories helping the rich. So politically, it's strange. But it also sort of reminds people that of those big issues that the country faces, that the economy faces, for which there were no answers really in this economy. As you say, it was no answers for in this budget. It was just sort of more steady as it goes. Now, part of our job, Ben is to assess the Labour Party. They are now consistently ahead in the opinion polls. As things currently stand, politics is a fickle business, but they will form the next government, whether as a minority or with a majority in their own right. What do you make of Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves? What do you make of Keir Starmer, Pat McFadden, the Labour Shadow Treasury front bench? Do you think they're credible? Yeah, I do. I've met both Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer. I profiled Rachel for the magazine and Keir for the paper. I was impressed by both of them. I was impressed by their grasp of detail. I mean, obviously, the Labour Party is still policy light at the moment, but, you know, there are politically expedient reasons for that. You don't come up with good ideas at this point of the election cycle. Because they'll be pinched. (laughs) They'll either be nicked or uh, scrutinised to the point of evaporating. (laughs) But I mean, one thing that I hear again and again talking to business people is the extent to which the Labour front bench is engaged with business, is out there talking to them, Mm. is listening to them, and is asking for good ideas from them. And almost all of the businesses who tell me that also describe how marked the contrast is with the Conservative Party. Now, the Conservative Party is in government, so it's sort of engaged in running the country on a day-to-day basis. But it is quite telling that the sort of traditional party of business is listening to and engaged with the business community less than the Labour Party at the moment. Now, with the Labour Party is, we've talked about this before, it's, you know, the prawn cocktail offensive of the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Never have so many crustaceans died in vain. Exactly. Said Michael Heseltine. He turned out to be wrong because we had 10 years of new Labour. Yeah. And how did new Labour get in? It's partly because they had charmed business and they had persuaded the electorate that they could be trusted with the economy, right? And the Tories had lost their reputation for economic competence, hadn't they, when we crashed out the exchange rate mechanism in the early 90s. The danger now, I think, is that the Tories lose that reputation again, which is why Jeremy Hunt is now Jeremy from accounts rather than (laughs) the Cape crusading tax cutter, which he wanted to be when he was campaigning to be Tory leader. And Prime Minister. Well, that's exactly right, isn't it? So Keir Starmer, the, the big accusation levelled at him is that he's sort of boring. What the country craves is boredom a little bit, especially when it comes to the economy. I think you're right. Jeremy Hunt is trying to sort of wrestle the boring mantle back off him. It's striking that polling evidence just before the budget said that six out of 10 British voters across all parties think the economy is going to get worse. I think now with these better OBR forecasts, and they are markedly better, the mood music may start to change. I personally think, and again, I've railed against this in my columns, I think we have been too gloomy. I think the commentariat's been too gloomy. I do see some green shoots. I don't think I'm being Panglossian about this. I, like you, Ben, follow closely the survey data, the PMI survey indices, indices from the CBI and others, there is a sense that business optimism is rising. 
we're not out of the woods by any means. My concern is that while I appreciate this decision on corporation tax was extremely finely balanced, particularly with the market turbulence on the country's doorstep during the budget statement. But I do worry that this big headline tax increase will stamp on those green shoots. Yeah, I agree with you on the green shoots. I mean, I suppose I'm slightly more pessimistic in my view of how this is affecting people at the moment because obviously inflation is still incredibly high. Sure. I mean, the OBR is saying that it will fall sharply by the end of the year. Let's hope that's right. But for every month that it doesn't, it's just the ratchet being tightened that little bit more and the cost of living squeeze just getting that little bit more painful. And until it starts dropping markedly, people are not going to be feeling better off. Well, Ben Wright, it's been fabulous to have you here on Planet Normal. Thanks so much for your take on this year's budget. Alison and I are huge fans of your writing. We often refer to it on our podcast. We put the link to your latest columns in the show notes to this episode. And we look forward to welcoming you back here on the Rocket of Right Thinking. Thank you for having me. Now on to our listener emails. Your message is sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We love to read your thoughts and we learn so much from you, the citizens of Planet Normal. There's been an ongoing deluge of emails about the Telegraph's lockdown file revelations, of course, and this is from Andrew. Those of us with vulnerable relatives knew at the time that the lockdowns were hugely damaging. The first lockdown was a learning curve, but after that, the data was good quality and we knew within a week of each lockdown two and three starting that cases were already dropping before they actually started. We knew the projected 4,000 weekly deaths if we didn't close small independent businesses and stop playing golf, seriously, were utter bunkum. Even Sturgeon allowed golf. We were told that the new year 2021 lockdown would only last as long as it took to jab vulnerable groups, but it went on seemingly forever. Not for Hancock, of course, who mixed households at will, says Andrew. He did what he liked in his personal life, while most of us followed the rules, missed funerals, had close family who couldn't stay at Christmas, bereaved relatives we couldn't visit for months, etc., etc. Hancock says, ha, you can't prosecute me because I broke rules and not laws. Will it work the other way for the plebs? No right of appeal if we were fined by overzealous police, whipped up by Hancock for drinking coffee whilst jogging with a friend, for example. Hancock told us he was following the science. He wasn't, and he knew that. He was gaslighting the nation. If that isn't worth a prison sentence, I don't know what is. Well, former Secretary of State for Health Matt Hancock isn't here to defend himself, and he would, of course, deny all wrongdoing and stress that he was doing the best he could in difficult circumstances. Here's an email from Alex. The lockdown files have revealed several truths, says Alex. One, the conduct of ministers during the lockdown period was not remotely scientific, was at times cult-like or frenzied, and lacked any sense of proportion or ethical integrity. Point two, says Alex. Matt Hancock should be personally culpable for inflicting crimes against humanity on the British people, but also that he was very far from alone. Again, Matt Hancock would deny all wrongdoing. And three, says Alex, even now, almost all Tory MPs, almost the entire opposition and the vast, vast majority of the British media remains willfully blind to and determined to suppress the authoritarian shambles and downright wickedness that they abetted or cheered on. Shame on anyone and everyone who shrugs at these realities. Thanks so much to Planet Normal, Alex. Now, Bruce emailed on a subject that we haven't touched much on lately, but which we're aware is vitally important to many Planet Normal listeners, and that's Northern Ireland and the so-called Windsor Framework. Bruce writes, Dear co-pilots, thanks so much for continuing to do the job that many journalists fail to do. In the same way that the true meaning of the treaties of Rome, Maastricht and Lisbon were kept from the public eye and full scrutiny, the Windsor Framework lives up to this tradition. It's a political fix rather than a genuine new initiative, argues Bruce. What the deal has done is unite the foes of Boris Johnson, that is, Sunak, Starmer and the EU. That's the truth of the new trust that exists between them. He is gone, but not yet buried. One of the aims of Brexit was to slowly disalign from the single market to make our economy more competitive, vibrant and globally relevant. What this deal does is to make dynamic alignment more permanent. It therefore does no favours to Northern Ireland and the Union 
nor to the rest of the UK. The short-term gains to be had from initial certainty to encouraging investment and opening the scientific programme horizon to the UK again, which was illegally blocked by the EU, says Bruce, will evaporate very quickly as the impact of shackling ourselves to a drowning man becomes apparent over the medium to long term. The Treasury will hail the benefits of staying in the orbit of the single market and rejoiners will rejoice at making a future debate easier. But in the meantime, an opportunity will have been missed. This reflects yet again the lack of political conviction that pervades Westminster these days. Why does the government respond to polls showing disillusionment since the 2016 referendum by staying quiet and doing dodgy deals about which it's less than honest, rather than coming out fighting with strong initiatives such as pushing through the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill? The only idea in politics these days is retaining power and damn the consequences. Keep on carrying on, Bruce. And a final email again on the lockdown files. We really have had so many Feelings are very strong. This is from Carpe. Lockdown was comfortably the most spectacularly moronic public health policy enacted in recorded history. A failure that could have been avoided by the basic safety net of a cost-benefit analysis. Instead, we had a government of scientifically illiterate cowards. We have a political class composed of charlatans and dross united in utter and complete ineptitude. And now we're paying the price. Excess deaths due to the NHS turning itself into a single disease service are now costing far more, argues Carpe, than was supposedly saved by lockdown. Isn't it typical of the Conservatives and Labour that the Covid inquiry is already a very slow-running joke? The sad fact is, our politicians and civil service mandarins are utterly third-rate. We deserve better. And so that's it from Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views, Email of the week. Well, it's Bruce on the subject of Northern Ireland. So, Bruce, send us an email to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk with your postal address. Put in the subject heading of that email, mug winner, and we'll send that prize to you. If you enjoy Planet Normal, please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, which helps others to find us so the Planet Normal family can grow. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever. To our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampett and Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other until next week, when Alison and I will be presenting part one of a two-part Planet Normal special marking the third anniversary of the start of lockdown. That is the 23rd of March 2020. And that's where Alison is this week. She's out on the road interviewing some incredible Planet Normal guests. Interviews we will present to you, dear listeners, during the course of our upcoming two part special so until next week it's goodbye from me it's goodbye from ben wright thanks so much for his fabulous contribution as ever and goodbye in her absence from co-pilot pearson too